I'm so bored of living. I wake up every morning in the same bed, I get dressed, and I eat the same breakfast and then take the same commute to work. I'm 28 years old and I'm terrified this is all there is. That's a clip from the Amazon series Undone about this woman who has this after-death experience. I actually like it. I think it's kind of interesting. Of course, it doesn't really follow near-death experience science, but then why would we expect it to? I mean, we have all these really good accounts, like the one from Dr. Eben Alexander, the Harvard neurosurgeon. But of course, we have to attack those people, take down those people, smear those people, and then substitute an entertaining and well-done account of what afterlife experiences are. Well, no big. The afterlife is a big tent. There's room for all. But if you want something closer to the truth, listen to people like Dr. Evan Alexander. Getting back to your original question about the attacks on me, uh, I will also say it's a very good thing that uh, uh, three physicians not involved in my care, and of course one of them was uh, Dr. Bruce Grayson, who spent more than uh, 45 years studying NDEs, but they wrote uh, up a case report on my medical records. And that came out in September of 2018 in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases. And that case report went a very long way towards painting the picture I tried to paint in Proof of Heaven. They actually go much further than I did. They had a lot more time to look at my medical records. Three of them did it independently, objectively. And I think they were even more shocked than I was that when my brain was so demonstrably offline, given my neurologic exams, given the lab values, given the CT and MRI scans showing all eight lobes in my brain affected, that I could have had the most robust, profound experience of my life in that setting. And in fact, when the peer reviewers at Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease asked them, how do you explain this case? They said, it's because he had an NDE. There really shouldn't have been any controversy. It was this manufactured controversy. I just wanted to kind of put an exclamation point on that because there are still these lingering doubts, which there will be because the effectiveness of smearing somebody, of taking somebody down culturally is very well understood. You will carry that forever. It just never comes clean because they're really, really good at that. I just pull up short when we start talking about doing and we have to do and we got to reduce that plastic thing in the in the ocean. Of course we do, but we just have to be. We have to be with each other. I would say you're absolutely right on the beam. And, uh, you know, early on in all these discussions after my NDE as I was trying to come to a deeper understanding of it all, trying to explain to people, trying to come up with a shift in worldview that made sense, I remember... Karen pointed out to me very brilliantly that really all we are here to do is to be the love that we are. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Akaris, and today we welcome Dr. Eben Alexander to Skeptico, and I can say back to Skeptico, but it's really been so long, not that he hasn't been a frequent topic of conversation on this show, but it's been so long since we had him back on that I almost have to reintroduce him. So Dr. Alexander, welcome, and thanks so much for coming. Well, Alex, thanks so much for having me back on. I remember having a really good time the last time we talked, and of course, a lot has happened since then, so it's great to be back with you again. Yeah, you know, what I always remember about that time is I remember 2012 when your really it's hard to hard to share with people how groundbreaking your book Proof of Heaven was, but what I remember was being on an airplane and walking from the front to the back and how many back covers of Proof of Heaven I saw as I was walking through the aisles. And of course, I was, you know, really into near death experience science and saying this is important science and we need to understand this. And bam, there it was the cultural shift that we all wanted and we're all waiting for was ha I felt like it was happening right before my eyes. And I felt like it was happening after that, as I talked to people. 
you know, what was it like for you to experience that, to experience one that that huge success, which was well deserved, because it's such a fantastic book, Proof of Heaven, but then the cultural shift that came along with that, what was that like? Well, it was absolutely extraordinary. <clears throat> and in many ways, of course, you know, I, I have to kind of reflect a bit on my own kind of uh, tangling with that whole world in terms of understanding it. But uh, the reality is, to me, it seems like the, the culture has made a tremendous uh, kind of upshift over the last uh, decade or two concerning NDEs, the nature of consciousness, you know, afterlife stories, uh, even reincarnation, I think, is being much more seriously considered by many. Uh, I, I know I was presenting at a, a scientific meeting in Belgium about uh, a year and a half ago when uh, one of the investigators from Liege in Belgium showed a slide showing the number of papers, scientific papers on NDEs, and that in, in uh, the year 2012 and 2013, there was this giant uh, kind of upsurge. Uh, they attributed it to uh, proof of heaven, but I think there's much more going on in the cultural landscape. Uh, of course, it was very gratifying to be part of that. Uh, and, and I can tell you that uh, really in the 12 years since my coma, uh, the thing that to me has been most gratifying has been working with scientists around the world uh, and realizing that there's a tremendous kind of impetus uh, in the scientific community. Now, that may not be the, the New York Times science section version of science or scientific American version of science, but some scientists who are deeply involved in the science of consciousness uh, are really in many ways banding together. And that's where I think a tremendous amount of progress is being made. And uh, I feel like a kid in a candy store because, you know, I went through this experience. It absolutely rocked my world. It turned my worldview 180 degrees. I mean, I promise you, an NDE is not what you expect if you're a materialist scientist. And to have this profound expansion of consciousness. And then later in the months after my coma, uh, going through medical records, talking over with my doctors, realizing that all the medical evidence was there, that I should have had no ability to even have a dream or hallucination given the damage to my neocortex. And yet I had the most robust, profound, detailed, memorable, uh, important, impactful uh, experience of my entire life when my brain was documented to be uh, offline. The neocortex was absolutely uh, damaged beyond function according to my medical records. My brain stem was damaged. So it's really been an extraordinary journey to be part of that Although I will confess early on, you know, I knew I was going public with a story that uh, was very much antithetical to a lot of my career. There was at least some concern that, you know, my career could suffer from it all. Although I knew, you know, this happened and the other similar stories have happened to other people. So we need to understand it more. Um, it's, you know, it was a bit of up and down, though, because there were a lot of attacks and uh, things like that. Um, and so anyway, I, I think the, the bottom line is the world is shifting dramatically. Uh, I think I've had a little bit to do with that, but uh, more importantly, is just that uh, scientists around the world are now taking this much more seriously. And we're starting to develop uh, a worldview, a, a kind of an encompassing system, a hypothetical system that can enable it, that goes beyond materialist thought. And that's, I think, been a stumbling block for science for a long time, is trying to come up with a kind of a theoretical framework that would support all this. And I think um, certainly a lot of what we cover in our third book, Living in a Mindful Universe, uh, goes that direction in helping to take the world to the next level. Yeah, and I really did enjoy this book, uh, Living in a Mindful Universe, and I thought it was a good, in a lot of ways, follow on. It it's, again, has some great personal accounts. We were just talking for a second before we started the interview that I, I love the story where you and Karen meet Ram Dask. I've always had a special affinity towards Neem Karoli Baba, although I've never, I never met him or experienced him mm -hmm. in person, but I thought his teachings. And Ram Dass is obviously the one who brought us that. And he's an interesting character too. Two Harvard guys kind of chatting. I'm sure you had a, a good conversation. But then Karen takes it to the next level in the book, and this is in Living in a Mindful Universe, where she talks about this heartfelt meeting and this encounter of expanded consciousness, which I thought, 
you know, in a way, this book, Living in a Mindful Universe, is allowed to exist because of proof of heaven, because of the space that you created, because of the dialogue that is possible. But I want to fill that back in because I don't want to get a little bit, I don't want to get too far into inside baseball. And you did a, a wonderful job of explaining kind of the rough sketch of the big picture. This guy, Eben Alexander the third, right? Dr. Eben Alexander the third. Yeah. Part of the reason for the book is it tells this almost epic story of kind of like a hero's journey kind of story of challenges and difficulties and life experiences that I thought connected with so many people, certainly connected with me on a deep level, on a parent level. And again, in this second book, Living in a Mindful Universe, you have so much to say about how that journey has evolved and how the family dynamic journey has evolved. So as much as you care to, do you want to share any of uh, any of that aspect of this? Because I don't think it's talked about a lot. I, I love talking about the science. I love talking about near-death experience, science and culture and all that stuff. But, but what about that part of it? Well, certainly the... Um you know, those who've read Proof of Heaven will realize uh, the kind of interesting dynamic in my life of being adopted. Uh, and, you know, I was put up for adoption when I was 11 days old. Uh, I was very fortunate. I was adopted into a beautiful and, and loving family. Uh, and I went through my life uh, very much blessed by that adoptive family. And, um, but like most adoptees, I, I was wondering about my, my heritage, my, my origin story. And so I would write letters to the children's home, you know, back when I was in my teens and 20s, seeking uh, information about my birth mother. I sensed my birth mother was out there, but had no notion about uh, family or anything. And it was really in uh, 2000 that I actually got a, a response back from them. I, I gave up looking for a long time uh, through most of my uh, years and, and just kind of forgot about that adoption story because I figured it wasn't really important. My life was going well, so you can forget about it, even though- Let me told. just interject because I, I picked this up from the second book and this is so powerful, so, so powerful and you're so open and honest about this. Your dad said, Eben, forget about it. You couldn't yeah. possibly remember anything and besides it doesn't matter. And and this is from the, the again, the, the parent adoption thing. Eben, we love you. We've given you everything. I gave you my name. You got it, buddy. You got everything. But that doesn't mean that's how you felt. You know what I mean? Well, you know, the interesting reality is intellectually, I knew he had given me all of that. My adoptive family couldn't have been better. They honored all my hopes and dreams. All that was beautiful. But the thing that my dad did not realize and that it took me a long time to realize was being left behind by your mother at age 11 days. What happened was I stopped eating. I went on a hunger strike. I was hospitalized for failure to thrive. And that's what a lot of uh, infants left behind will do that. Uh, and it's, from my point of view, it's because they basically uh, do not feel they have a reason to live. If their mother has left them behind, they have a serious challenge at a, a deep uh, emotional level about whether or not they're worthy of love. And, and that is something we discussed a little bit in that book, Living in a Mindful Universe. But that was a lot of what I wrestled with. And of course, I was very loved by my adoptive family. But that doesn't change the fact that I, I still had memory of events that happened when I was 11 days old that were so shocking, it caused me to try to off myself, you know, with that hunger strike. Uh, failure to and, thrive. And, and, and if you will tell the story, I thought it was again, I, I don't want to just dwell on this, but it's super important, I think, to the to the larger picture is the your, your adoptive parents, your parents, I'll just say that, right. then are able to conceive and have a child, which they didn't think was possible. And then what happens to, to you again, the, the, the knowledge that we carry as you know, pre uh, verbal, you know, that, amazing. It is amazing, and, and we do carry it. In fact, it's one of the biggest kind of problems with our modern society is we believe that everything, uh, the only things important and the only things that are real are linguistically described narratives. And uh, so, of course, we miss a tremendous amount of what's kind of going on in our lives. But to me, that adoption story was a fundamental part 
of my whole journey because in many ways uh, I could see kind of sh the shadow side, the echoes of my not feeling worthy of love through a lot of my life before coma. And it had to do with, uh, it affected my relationships in many ways. Uh, but it was really a huge part of the journey. And of course, in those earliest days, I was having trouble even visualizing as, as an issue in my life, even though it was a very important one in my early life. Um, but this entire journey, including my NDE, and then of course, including the 12 years plus of resolution beyond that point, has been a tremendous lesson in how all aspects of our lives, the good, the bad, the challenges, the hurdles, these are beautiful gifts. And that was something that I uh, kind of sensed after my NDE. It was apparent to me that uh, some of the biggest uh, kind of hardships of my life had actually been the, the catalysts or the kind of mileposts that mark my greatest progress as I grew into things and kind of grew into a deeper knowing of myself. Uh, and, and that's really been the best part of the journey. It's this extraordinary richness of having that, for one thing, a very expanded view of self relative to the universe through an NDE and deep kind of spiritual sense of uh, a certain role in life and a certain responsibility and an acknowledgement that our choices absolutely matter at every level. Uh, but then to have this kind of resolution of that whole adoption issue and the worthiness of love and that uh, kind of feeling of, of being less than for much of my life. And so it really has been an extraordinary gift, but it could not have come without the hardships. It could not have come without those difficulties. And uh, for that, I am just grateful. And that's why what I try and share with people is to embrace those challenges, the hurdles in life, uh, illness, injury, uh, because in so many ways, they can be the uh, basically the engines of growth to help our souls come into the higher soul that we came here to be. And I love being awakened to that. And that's been a huge part of the kind of expansion of my idea of self and a relationship to the universe that resulted from my NDE. But I must confess a tremendous amount of my growth has also been due to meeting, you know, thousands of other experiencers and working with a scientific community worldwide that realizes consciousness is fundamental in the universe. So I was gifted tremendously uh, by this, uh, what, you know, some people would look at a weakened coma due to a severe gram negative bacterial meningoencephalitis as something of a, uh, you know, bad luck. Well, no. In my case, it was an extraordinary uh, gift uh, to show me ways of healing, uh, of understanding of our kind of uh, alignment of our purpose with the universe that I think can be useful to all beings. And that's why I love sharing the story and expanding on it, because the science is fully there supporting this uh, primacy of consciousness. And, and what that does is returns uh, a very powerful notion of free will. You know, free will is uh, pretty much on the chopping block with materialist neuroscience uh, because basically they're pretending that all those ion channels are still behaving like Newtonian billiard balls and with, you know, a perfectly determined course of action. But no, the deepest message of quantum physics is really one of free will. It opens the door to free will of sentience of the mental layer of the universe. And that's where our healing can come in full force. You know, I mean, the medical community has admitted to mind over matter for more than six decades by honoring placebo effect as their gold standard for assessing any new medical uh, treatment or modality. And a placebo effect is nothing more than an admission that our beliefs, attitudes, and thoughts can have a tremendous influence on our health. And uh, I would say that this revolution in understanding of consciousness greatly expands that notion of our free will and ability to become more whole, more of the soul we came here to be. Awesome. And I, I do want to circle back on something because you mentioned hardship and what you had to go through. And uh, also, you know, you're, you're a humble guy in terms of talking about your influence here. But as we talked about at the beginning, and I can't emphasize it enough, you were that swing. You were that upswing in the chart that the guy had, you know, you were selected for whatever reason to be, we have to understand and for whatever reason, but you were also the guy who faced really unbelievable hardship when we look about, when we look at it. But I think it's such an important lesson. I think it's a lesson and, and we might not totally agree with this, but we can agree with the data, maybe not the interpretation of the data, but what you experience from a cultural takedown standpoint, a takedown 
of Dr. Eben Alexander, which was really so absurd on some level, so over the top that anyone should have been able to spot it. But let me recap because we've talked about a lot on this show. So you come out with this book and again, folks, you know, the, the, the way that I, I always like to relate this to people is like, when I tell people that the quote unquote prominent atheist, Sam Harris, who's also a neuroscientist, said that, uh, what did he exactly say? It's alarmingly unscientific, this guy's book. And then he went on to say, this guy doesn't know neuroscience. And when I relate to that story to people, people always have this quizzical look and they go, but I thought you said he was a Harvard neurosurgeon, as if you know he was in the Harvard Medical School teaching students neuroscience and neurosurgery. And I go, yeah. And I'm like, well then why would, it doesn't even, it doesn't even raise to the level of where it would kind of even be reasonable. Or, you know, another prominent guy, and he's passed now, but Oliver Sacks. Oliver Sacks, who was loved by the psychology community and all that, he felt a need to come out. Esquire magazine, which we covered, you know, on this show extensively, uh, came out with a cover story. Eben Alexander, you know, and w when you really break it down, they're caught just with bold faced lies. We broke it down. Lies, misrepresentations. Look, where where the the physician who was your primary care physician in the hospital has to write a response and say, I have been misrepresented. I'm deeply concerned about what Esquire magazine has written. It's not at all my opinion about Dr. Alexander or about what he's rep. This is a cultural takedown. It's, in my opinion, it's not accidental. It's not organic. It's not some guys sitting around and going, well, gee, you know, I have a different scholarly opinion on that based on my analysis. What do you think about that? Are you willing to even explore the possibility that there was some, some design behind that takedown? Well, I would say that you know, we, everybody um, has a certain addiction to their beliefs. And uh, this is uh, true for all people. And that includes scientists and philosophers. Um, you know, we like to think we understand things. And so people uh, kind of uh, are attracted uh, to a set of beliefs that they develop over time. And in our culture, unfortunately, scientific materialism has held sway for, you know, many generations now. Uh, and that, uh, I, I would say, <clears throat> has led to a tremendous amount of damage. But when I look at, for example, the uh, critiques uh, that Sam Harris and uh, Oliver Sacks uh, came at me with, uh, mainly it was because they didn't, they hadn't really read my book, for one thing. They basically but, were But Evan, no, they, they read article. your book. No, they, they, I talked to Sam Harris. They read your book. That, that's why, I, and you don't have to go there, but I, I, I think we, we kind of do our community a disservice if we don't address this head on. So if you're saying you, you believe differently, if you believe well, Sam Harris is an honest player who just is, you know, just doing his best and just couldn't understand it and all that, I mean, fine, but I don't see it that way. I see it well, as spirituality is a, an a, assault on scientific materialism and there's certain people that have a vested interest in seeing that not prevail and that they just like in everything else in life they are going to exercise whatever extent of control they have to to see that that doesn't happen so you don't have to agree with that but to me that well, seems self-evident i would say in many ways you're exactly right and for example if you compare sam harris's attack on me where he was basically uh, trying to say that uh, this, if 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 this experience happened at all, it looked like a, a DMT experience. He 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 went that far to try and say this is nothing more than that. It's a biochemical uh, thing. We can forget about it. Uh, and then if you simultaneously go and read Bernardo Castrop's blog postings at the same time, responding to Sam Harris, Castrop comes at it with a far more kind of intelligent, open-minded, and uh, I would say realistic way of interpreting my experience, uh, where he is fully open to the reality of that experience. 
And I, I would say, first of all, I, I think you're making a good point in many ways, that there is kind of this uh, groundswell of kind of angst and recoil in, in some members of the scientific community and also in those who claim to be science, science journalists. Uh, that's a bias, it's a prejudice, and it, and it is, goes into attack mode. As soon as you mention anything about heaven or God or an afterlife, uh, they go ballistic. And yet, uh, you know, the 300 plus scientists now associated with Galileo Commission uh, org, for example, and I'm one of the scientific advisors for that group, will actually argue that these experiences uh, help us, and, and in that I would say not only afterlife, NDE, deathbed vision experiences, but also the tremendous uh, scientific literature on reincarnation. And there's a lot of it out there, but the biggest body I know of is, is the UVA group, University of Virginia, Division of Perceptual Studies, more than six decades of work. And what you realize is that a lot of scientists uh, currently studying consciousness uh, completely uh, go with uh, the reality of these experiences because <clears throat> they're not forbidden by science at all. In fact, in many ways, when you look at uh, quantum physics and how it's evolved over the last few decades, uh, not only uh, is kind of the spiritual realm, a realm of unified mental uh, function and of uh, kind of shared purpose. Not only is that uh, allowed by the findings of scientific experiments and mod modern paradigms, it's actually demanded. I mean, the alternative, for example, in interpreting the measurement paradox in quantum physics is the many worlds interpretation, in infinite parallel universes. And I think that most of us can agree that doesn't appear to be the world we live in. And that's where I would say that science will actually benefit from appreciating, you know, this bigger database about the afterlife and about reincarnation, about what it tells us about consciousness, about the relationship of ontology with epistemology, uh, and how we can come to a deeper understanding of ourselves. So it's really a very important shift uh, to move us to the next level. And, and I think one specific example of how I see science as growing into this would be the, the recent uh, set of scientific papers over the last nine years or so uh, uh, using fMRI, functional magneto, uh, uh, you know, magnetic resonance imaging scans, as well as uh, magnetoencephalography and other techniques of looking at the brain. And with <clears throat> when you study people under the influence of certain serotonin 2A type plant medicines like psilocybin, uh, magic mushrooms, uh, DMT, uh, active principle in ayahuasca, uh, LSD. There are papers out there from London, from South America, that show that the brains of people under the influence of these substances goes dark. There's no part of the brain that increases in activity. In fact, the whole brain gets out of the way. And from a scientific perspective, that doesn't mean we have to stop. It just means we have to realize that within the materialist paradigm and trying to look at phenomenal experiences, the result of chemical reactions and electron fluxes, you have to realize, no, there are higher ordering principles involved uh, that give us our phenomenal experience. And they're not simply the result of atoms and molecules following uh, the laws of physics, chemistry, and biology. And so it really helps for science to expand its worldview beyond materialism. I don't think that science well-practiced is limited to materialism, except for the fact, of course, that people like to measure things and most measurements kind of occur in the material world. Uh, but I think that a, a scientific mind, for example, when I look at the work coming out of UVA DOPS and especially of those three landmark books from Ed Kelly, uh, you know, Irreducible Mind, Beyond Physicalism and Now Consciousness Unbound, they're a beautiful example of how science can go far beyond materialism in trying to explain the nature of reality, as in fact it must, because there's more to this universe than the physical world. And um, you know, it, it, getting back to your original question about the attacks on me, uh, I will also say it's a very good thing that uh, uh, three physicians not involved in my care, and of course one of them was uh, Dr. Bruce Grayson, who spent more than uh, 45 years studying NDEs, but they wrote uh, up a case report on my medical records. And that came out in September of 2018 in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases. And that uh, case report went a very long way towards 
uh, painting the picture I tried to paint in Proof of Heaven. They actually go much further than I did. They had a lot more time to look at my medical records. Three of them did it independently, objectively. Uh, and I think they were even more shocked than I was that my brain, uh, you know, that when my brain was so demonstrably offline, given my neurologic exams, given the lab values, given the CT and MRI scans showing all eight lobes in my brain affected, that I could have had the most robust, profound uh, experience of my life, uh, you know, in that setting. And in fact, when the peer reviewers at Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease asked them, how do you explain this case? Because just like when I reviewed my records, I was like, this, these are the records of someone who is bound to die, not someone who is going to end up having a full recovery. So it was a deep mystery to me. Likewise to uh, these three doctors who reviewed my case. And so when they were challenged, how do you explain this horrific uh, uh, medical circumstance resulting in a full recovery? They said, it's because he had an NDE. That was enough to satisfy the peer reviewers of a scientific medical journal. Oh, now we have an explanation. And it's because they knew of other cases, like Anita Morjani, who uh, wrote the book Dying to Be Me and had an advanced stage four lymphoma, that uh, she was within hours of death by any doctor's reckoning. And yet she had a profound NDE, came back to this world uh, almost 20 years ago is when she did all this. And it was because of her NDE, she came back. Likewise, Dr. Mary C. Neal, the orthopedic surgeon, she wrote a book called To Heaven and Back, uh, Warm Water Drowning in uh, Chile, uh, kayaking back in 1999. She was underwater more than 30 minutes, her legs broken under a boulder. Uh, she was brought to the surface dead, resuscitated, ended up making a full recovery. She had a profound NDE. So it's, it's simply taking our lesson from placebo effect at acknowledgement of beliefs, thoughts, uh, and attitudes playing a tremendous role in our health and realizing, well, in these deeper kind of spiritual journeys of NDEs, uh, you have extraordinary options for returning health to a soul on a journey. But it involves waking up to that much bigger role that we play, the much bigger soul that we are, a soul that has been here many lives before, will be here many lives to come, and participates in this evolution of all of consciousness. And that's where I think so much of the current revolution in science about primacy of consciousness and this deep debate about free will and uh, whether it really exists and how can it manifest is so important. If for nothing else, to heal ourselves, to come into wholeness. That's what this is really all about, this awakening. You know, I want to just return. To, I want to make sure people got that little story that you did there. There really shouldn't have been any controversy. It was really cut and dried, but it was this manufactured controversy. But the story behind it, and you just said that now it's been medically reviewed. And you know, I just had uh, Dr. Bruce Grayson on the show recently. And of course, he's written this terrific book after and you are uh, uh, mentioned uh, throughout that. But I, I love the story that he tells about kind of the personal part again of you have this experience, and you get some pretty sage advice from your son who says, Dad, don't read anything. You're going to be tempted to kind of go there. Don't. Just get your account down. And that turns out to be really good advice. You do that. Then you get in the car and you drive and you guys meet with uh, Dr. Grayson. And uh, so that's kind of an important meeting. And then later on, he says what you just recounts that just a couple of years ago, they finally published this, but he had investigated it prior to saying, okay, let me examine this case from a medical standpoint. And they had three independent people. And I just love this little snippet, which I was trying to lead to. Grayson goes, well, then I, you know, kind of powwowed with my colleagues to see where there were any discrepancies, because to me, it was clear cut. And he said that, there were no discrepancies. <laughs> Everybody came right. back and said, this is, why am I even examining this? This is a slam dunk. Of course, that this is a non-functioning brain. This person should have died. And if they, and if they didn't die, which they 99% they would have died, they no way they would ever recover. So again, to me, that all points to a manufactured kind, but I'm going to get into that. You already, you already handled that. I just wanted to kind of put an exclamation point on that because there are still these lingering doubts which there will be because the the 
effectiveness of smearing somebody, of taking somebody down culturally, is is very well understood. These guys do a great job. You will carry that. You will carry that forever. It just never comes clean because they're really, really good at that. But back to your other point, let me kind of wrap that into a question. It's kind of a related question. And again, we might not see it the same way, but I, I just interviewed this wonderful guy, uh, St Dr. Steve Taylor, and he's written this book, and I hope I can get the name right, Why Science Spiritual Needs- Spiritual Science. Spiritual Science, exactly. Why Science Needs Spirituality, fill in the blank. And I, I, I love the guy, but he's got it completely backwards. It's not that science needs spirituality. Science is doing everything it freaking can to keep spirituality out of the picture, to keep them out of their game. Their game is up when they let spirituality in. So you can talk as you are about the advancements and maybe we can ground up, you know, from the ground up, from the bottom up, you know, change the tide. And we certainly have to. So I'm, we have to try, right? So what you're talking about is certainly true. But I do kind of call into question whether or not we should consider the alternative is that science is actively trying to keep spirituality out of the equation because it's not good for business. It's not good for science as we know it's business. Well, those are uh, interesting points. I've read uh, uh, Steve Taylor's book. I thought it was actually quite good. Um, and, uh, you know, as I was mentioning a few minutes ago, with the, talking about the uh, psychedelics and looking at the brain and the brain goes dark, that's why I'm saying science does need to expand beyond material. The materialist thinking of brain creates consciousness is clearly false. And, uh, and, and so that's where, that's for me an example of how science can be more open-minded and grow into a bigger picture to try and get to the truth. I mean, ultimately, we all would like to know the capital T truth, you know, the, 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 the true nuts and bolts of how the universe works. And, uh, you know, I'd say especially given all the study of NDEs uh, and all the uh, evidence uh, accumulating in, say, in the hospice literature, about the power of deathbed visions, the, the reality, the transformative abilities that they bring. And then you've got this tremendous body of evidence on reincarnation, not just from groups like UVA DOPS, where they have more than 2,500 cases of past life memories in children suggestive of reincarnation, but you have this whole world of transpersonal psychology, beginning with the work of Carl Jung and Charles Tartt, and then uh, moving on to Stan Groff and Michael Newton, Brian Weiss and others, where they realized that to deal with the issues faced by their patients, uh, you know, with very psychological, psychiatric issues, that by doing uh, hypnotic regression and uncovering memories of past lives, you start to explain and understand why certain challenges are there in this lifetime. And not only that, you gain the tools to start to heal them. So this is not just some kind of idle, you know, armchair philosophy question of, you know, afterlife and reincarnation, are they real or not? Uh, you know, just to tell us what happens when we die. It's a much bigger question of how do we live the lives we have here and now day to day? How do we make choices? How do we see ourselves in relationship to others and to the universe? And I would argue that this kind of expanded uh, vision of a study of consciousness uh, allows us to greatly expand our own kind of self vision of our relationship with the universe and uh, really how to act, how to be, uh, how to think of ourselves so that when we come to the end of a life of a physical body, we don't get that extreme shock <laughs> you know, of having your body die and all of a sudden realize you're more conscious than you've ever been before. And damn, did I waste that life following a falsehood that was promoted by the material of scientific community just because their theoretical models were inadequate uh, and they couldn't figure out what the empirical data was telling them doesn't mean we have to just kind of give up and pretend total ignorance and, and follow this materialist uh, uh, mindset down into the abyss. No, this is about, and, and as I said earlier, with placebo effect and healing, uh, it's such an extraordinary capacity to kind of improve ourselves and gain health and wholeness. Why in the world would we keep pursuing a very limited, disproven worldview like materialism? I mean, essentially, it should have been banned from the world 80 years ago with the advent <laughs> of quantum physics. 
you know, materialism really has died. It's just that a lot of materialists have not read the memo yet, but it's an absolute fact when you study the data. And if human beings want to understand human experience, they need to realize this science of consciousness is about trying to get to a deeper understanding of some of the toughest, most challenging experiences that humans have ever had. And yet they reveal some very profound and refreshing and liberating truths about our true nature. Uh, and that's where I think this is a very important thing to do to share this discussion, get it out there. I'm glad you do exactly what you do because I think you are uh, playing a, a central role in helping to catalyze tremendous awakening of this planet, which I would say is absolutely necessary if we're going to survive. I mean, with all the addiction of fossil fuels, plastic pollution, we are in deep trouble from materialist thinking and a false sense of separation. We need to take responsibility for our choices. Well, let's, you know, you, you touch on something that's uh, super important, and those are very kind words, and I appreciate it. But you touched on, you know, where a lot of your energy and mission has gone in, in recent years, and that is the tools of healing, the tools of becoming whole, the tools of, you know, because one of the things we know from the, this near-death experience, and we've explored on this show, it doesn't mean that the journey's over and it doesn't mean that the challenges aren't over and it doesn't mean that you're still not going to face stuff and in some ways it, it it does make it worse right it makes some of our relationships worse because not everyone went through the experience with us so they might not see it the same way and the world hasn't gone through the experience so there's a lot of issues there so i want you to talk about healing and uh you and karen your partner have done some you know specific work, some specific products that might help that. But the other aspect of that that you just touched on earlier that I find super powerful, free, easy, low risk is just these accounts, these accounts, these heartfelt, soul felt, near death experience accounts can be incredibly healing. They've been healing for me, but they've been healing to so many people that I've talked to. So can you speak to that for a minute? Well, you make a beautiful point there. And, you know, Ken Ring, who was one of the founding uh, members of the International Association of Near-Death Studies back in the mid-1970s, a few decades ago, he wrote a paper about how uh, influential uh, just knowing about NDEs, studying NDEs, reading some of the stories or hearing them presented from an NDE or can have a, a very profound, positive, transformative effect on people who get that knowledge. Uh, and Karen and I realized uh, early on in our collaboration, beginning um, a decade or so ago, um, that you really have to meet people where they are. And don't expect people to, you know, come uh, to me to hear my story, but I've got to share with them what they are ready to hear in, in a way that can help them to grow to the next level. Uh, and that's always going to be through personal experience. So, it, and it's not just about sharing the stories. Uh, but, but encouraging people to develop a practice of going within. As you realize that the modern scientific model of consciousness is really one of one mind, that we're really sharing one mind. I like to uh, say it's like the facets on a diamond. The diamond is the one mind. Each one of us is a facet. So we're, we have slightly different perspectives of what is going on with the one mind, but we're all contributing to the knowing of the one mind. Uh, and personal experience is a way of, of gleaning that. And especially like in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, as we argue for objective idealism, you know, the primacy of consciousness. And we talk about the brain is a filter. So it filters in this primordial mind. But that's when you realize that going within mind is actually a way to go out into the universe. That's why meditation, centering prayer, can be incredibly powerful gifts. Um, and uh, so sacred acoustics uh, is, uh, is Karen's company, as you point out. And in fact, I played a, a, a kind of a seminal role in, in getting she and her business partner, Kevin Costi, to join together uh, back in 2011 to start bringing these differential frequency brainwave entrainment tones out to people because I was astonished at the power 
that they gave me. Uh, and that included power to go back into my NDE and develop a much richer relationship. So this was not just about recovering uh, information about my NDE as much as developing an ongoing relationship with the various uh, kind of entities and denizens and uh, that infinitely uh, loving God force at the core of all. That was all part of my uh, meditative practice. And yet I also realized Karen had never had an NDE. And yet she had a profound sense of the uh, infinitely healing power of that loving force at the core from her own meditative experiences. And so when I encouraged uh, her and Kevin to put together this company, Sacred Acoustics, and people can learn a lot more at sacredacoustics.com, it was really to help share those tools. And just to help your listeners understand why they're different, I would point out that every sound you've ever heard, including a chant or anthem or hymn that might have influenced a, you know, a transition into a transcendental mode of consciousness or a spiritual awareness, all those sounds are processed up in the neocortex and the acoustic cortex in circuits that really have been finalized in the last few million years in uh, Homo sapiens and in higher primates. The sounds of differential frequency brainwave entrainment, what are loosely called binaural beats, uh, it's a phenomenon that was first discovered in the, in the 1800s by a Prussian physicist. Uh, it was, uh, binaural beats were used in the late 20th century to enhance out-of-body experiences, remote viewing, things like that, enhance transcendental non-local consciousness. And uh, that's what piqued my interest. And I believe, and this is something we go into more detail in, in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, to explain, but I believe the mechanism is because those differential frequency sounds, slightly different tones to the two ears, are actually intersecting in the lower brainstem. Um, and that is a circuit that arose more than 300 million years ago. Uh, there's a general principle in evolutionary biology that if you want to more fully understand a function and an anatomic structure related to function, you really want to look back through the evolution of that anatomy uh, going back millions of years if you can. And when we do, we find that these differential frequency uh, sounds are, are processed in the lower brainstem and the superior olivary nucleus complex. And that gives them an opportunity to have a tremendous modulatory role on ascending signals that we believe govern kind of the modulation of consciousness in the, in the neocortex. That's the human part of consciousness. All the details of conscious awareness come from the neocortex, but it's basically being driven from way down at this lowest level I'm talking about. And that's where we believe sacred acoustics and similar binaural beat brainwave entrainment can have such a powerful effect at uh, liberating people uh, from this kind of here and now and, and bodily sense of self and being locked into a material world. It's what allows our consciousness to really roam free just as it will be set free when our physical brain and body die at the end of our physical life. And uh, so to have a kind of a leg up on this uh, kind of exploring consciousness beyond the veil of the brain is a tremendous benefit. And it's something that we see over and over in our workshops. And I see it in a lot of the feedback Karen gets on her Sacred Acoustics website. She's got tens of thousands of people all around the world using that technology for deep meditative experiences. Uh, and it can bring extraordinary healing. And uh, I mean, we, we did uh, participate with a psychiatrist in New York on a, a pilot study that appeared in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases in February, 2020. It's by Dr. Anna Yusum. It was looking at sacred acoustics tones as a modality for alleviating uh, anxiety and depression symptoms. Uh, and in fact, this, uh, this uh, study that Dr. Yusum performed showed a 26% reduction uh, in anxiety symptoms over two weeks, uh, listening to the tones combined with talk therapy, Whereas with talk therapy alone, it was only a 7% reduction. So that's a pretty dramatic uh, effect. And, and when you read the qualitative reports in her study, you find even more kind of interesting evidence of kind of the transcendental nature of these experiences and how people um, have benefited from this kind of meditative practice, even though it can be very simple. Uh, and I think that that is where there's extraordinary power. Uh, the only other point I'd like to make kind of along those same lines is there's also a, a big literature coming up lately in addiction medicine, treating uh, uh, some of the worst addictions and also treating fear of death and cancer patients. 
using psilocybin, magic mushrooms. The interesting thing is you only need one or two doses of the mushroom. So it's not as if you need psilocybin in your system on a regular daily basis to accomplish these extraordinary goals of getting rid of fear of death and defeating addiction. What you need is the proper therapeutic setting. What I would argue is that is just another example of traversing the veil, getting in closer touch with your higher soul, uh, with that primordial mind uh, in ways that indie ears have done you know, for millennia. Uh, that coming in touch with that oneness has a tremendous power to heal us in this life. And likewise, I would say that those uh, kind of psilocybin experiments uh, with uh, fear of death and with um, addictions is just showing us the power of our higher soul and free will to do this. You're using the psilocybin as a catalyst. I would argue that you can easily use binaural beat brainwave entrainment to get at least as far, if not further. So it's a, a very important modality to help us in healing, coming into better mental health, uh, coming into more alignment. And I believe ultimately, uh, much more radical healing, uh, like you would find on the Institute of Noetic Sciences website, if you put in the search term, uh, spontaneous remission, and uncover that book they published in 1995 with 3,500 cases of curing of cancer, infections, other things beyond any expectation of medical intervention. Uh, and I believe that that is the way of the future. Our healing, our medical uh, arts are going to change dramatically over the next few decades because of the true power of our mind over matter to heal and bring us more into wholeness. Yeah, and the great thing about the binaural beats is safe. I mean, you're just listening to something easy, inexpensive. I mean, it kind of hits all the, all the things there. The, the one thing and I can't remember if it was from reading it in your guys book or someplace else. But I thought uh, the hypothesis for why it might work is interesting that if you have two different frequencies playing in two different two different ears, and you're getting at that primordial brain, and it's trying to resolve it at some point, it just goes, Oh, to heck with it and kind of gets out of the way kind of thing to put it in simple terms. Do you have any quick thoughts on that? Well, I would say essentially, what you're doing is you're kind of giving it another task. You're taking all that circuitry yeah. in the brain that involves, you know, ignition circuits in the lower brain stem 40 times per second, firing these now signals to coordinate the thalamocortical loops, that whole engine of consciousness. And of course, the ultimate details of consciousness depend entirely on the neocortex. You know, everything we see in the occipital lobes, everything we hear in the acoustic cortex, our planning, bodily position, all these things in parietal and frontal lobes. Every bit of that uh, is this machine that we're kind of used to being in. And what these binaural beats do, I believe, is at a very deep level, they kind of disconnect your conscious awareness from all that machinery. And that is why they were useful for things like remote viewing, out-of-body experiences, as shown in the late 20th century. And I believe that's exactly what's going on here. And uh, I've learned to ride those tones beautifully. It's a very powerful technique. Uh, and, and I mean, what you're trying to do essentially is take the little voice in your head. You know, so many of us identify with a little running stream of thoughts in our head. Well, never forget, I love how Michael Singer calls that stream of thoughts in our head, the annoying roommate, because <laughs> it, it's that, you know, it's a parlor trick. Uh, that is not your consciousness. That is not the deep and profound mystery of consciousness. That profound mystery is the awareness. Yes. And it's because in many ways, the universe is self-aware. And we, that's called the mental layer of the universe. And it's universal. It's been there since before the Big Bang. And that is what we can tap into. And yeah. uh, that's what we do by basically uh, uh, kind of monotonizing this machinery that normally keeps us in the here and now and sense of self. Uh, and that allows our conscious awareness to really uh, go places. And that's where we start to realize much of our connection with the rest of the universe the information we can glean, and also a much richer sense of kind of free will and our ability to influence our evolving reality. Uh, you know, you can easily argue if you're stuck in your ego mind all the time, of course you don't have free will. You're an automaton. But by engaging your basically primordial mind, by engaging the mind of the universe that we all share, uh, you start to reach a point where you're actually uh, 
able to manifest a free will that can have tremendous influence on your life and on the uh, evolving uh, kind of human awareness and consciousness and kind of uh, the mission of humanity will change dramatically as we realize this unification. I mean, I mentioned a little while ago the damage done to this world by the false sense of separation uh, that comes from materialist thinking. You know, it's right there at the heart of reductive materialism. Break it all down into the parts, understand how those parts interact, and then you can understand the whole world. Well, that assumes that, you know, electrons, protons, quarks, all these things dancing around following the laws of physics um, give us the events of human lives. Well, no, that's not true because there is uh, a set of top-down causal principles that are far more uh, important in determining the events that unfold around us. And that top-down causality uh, is something that comes from that mental layer of the universe. And for those interested in the quantum physics aspect of that, I would steer you to the writings of George F.R. Ellis, the South African mathematician who's written extensively about top-down causality uh, in quantum systems. But I believe that is really kind of the heart of where you go with objective idealism, filter theory, uh, and then uh, kind of that notion of, uh, of uh, top-down causality and how it manifests in this world. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of potential for that kind of a worldview to expand. This is something that we call the primordial mind hypothesis. We talk about it uh, in chapter five of Living in Mindful Universe, but a lot of my thinking on it has advanced since that book came out. So I believe uh, it probably is time to write another book. And, Great. Uh, well, I, I want to talk about that in just a minute. I want to know what's what's coming up for you, but I, I can't leave that last part without touching on a couple of things. One, I have a ton of respect and love Michael Singer. I think he's I think he's wonderful. And I, I love the yogic approach and uh, well, your explanation for the binaural beats potentially hypothetically how the how they might be working on a more neurophysical level kind of thing i thought it was so awesome and it connects with me because i'm a long time kind of yoga practitioner michael singer has that background you know and so many other people but early on in you know the asana kind of thing i had a really good teacher and it was the same kind of thing like okay now move your left toe here while you do your hip and see the energy this length is a bunch of instructions for what purpose till finally your mind goes oh to heck with it i can't keep track of all these physical things that are going on and boom that's when that little shift opens up and so i thought the way that you connected that is it, it, hypothetically is super super interesting and i think people that have gone there in, in that kind of in any kind of different modality where they've gotten that heck you can get there by driving don't do this but you know by driving a daydream you kind of get to some of that same effect so that's fantastic but let me ask you this because you just you teed it up what is in the future for dr evan alexander where, where are you going i'm sure there's more books i'm sure there's you're connecting with so many people you, and, and you're bringing us this kind of reporting from the frontier because you are connected with so many folks i'm sure you're going to continue to do that but what are your plans for the future well i can tell you in the near term karen and i are very busy we're participating in a, a certain competition that i'm sure uh, many of your listeners are probably aware of uh, the Bigelow Institute of Consciousness Studies in Las Vegas is organizing um, basically an essay competition um, to, for the best essay supporting the scientific uh, evidence that uh, there's an afterlife. And uh, I find that absolutely fascinating. I think the evidence uh, is really there. It's strong enough now that anybody who pursues the evidence will come to the conclusion that the afterlife is more likely than not. Uh, and so we're very excited about that competition. It kind of dovetails into a lot of our other uh, kind of projects moving forward. Uh, but I believe that uh, I, I can confess that since uh, Living in a Mindful Universe came out in 2017, uh, I've really uh, come to kind of a, a deeper understanding in my own mind that I, I believe in uh, looking at how brain and mind connect in, uh, you know, in the brain in a way that would support this filter theory uh, and uh, notion of primordial consciousness and all. And that's where I really want to go next. And uh, this involves collaboration with uh, scientists around the world. I do a lot of work, as I mentioned earlier, with GalileoCommission.org, with some of the other investigators there. 
And I really think that that is uh, a, a major next step because one of the tremendous hurdles to the scientific community getting on board with all this uh, has just been that kind of missing link of connection uh, at the brain mind level of uh, what all is going on. And, and what most people get trapped into is they keep following the material side and the brain side and thinking that is going to lead us there where you actually have to take the lead of phenomenal experience and of consciousness itself. And I believe when we come at it from that direction, and that includes this much bigger uh, kind of expression of consciousness of afterlife, reincarnation, all of it writ large and uh, uh, present through your models, uh, but that's what I really would like to do in the next few years is come up with a much better explanation of kind of the hypothetical possibilities uh, for the scientific community to, to relieve us of the shackles of materialism. And that's where I'd hope I would go next. I'm, I'm not sure exactly. I'm sure this Bigelow project will lead us into a lot of interesting kind of territory. Uh, but from my point of view, the real gift to the world uh, and the one that uh, absolutely uh, will help this uh, help humanity to grow into this awakening would be a better uh, kind of nuts and bolts explanation of, from a neuroscientist about what is going on with this uh, kind of idea of primordial mind, uh, of objective idealism or analytic idealism, uh, how is it really working, and how can we all uh, interact with that kind of mental layer of the universe uh, to um, really bring the uh, the dreams of our higher soul into fruition. That's essentially what this is about, is coming into humankind's uh, potential, which I think the beliefs of our modern society are uh, incredibly falsely restricting uh, as to what is possible for humans to accomplish. And I think the more we investigate, you know, with deep meditation, centering prayer, the different modalities of kind of getting into deep conscious awareness and the information systems of the universe, and then being able to uh, use that in terms of our free will of uh, manifesting the world of our dreams, that is where this whole world can change dramatically. Uh, I mean, from my point of view, this shift of understanding is uh, irreversible. And I know, I, 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 in fact, I recently rewatched your uh, 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 interview with, uh, with Bruce Grayson, and I also had seen the one with Steve Taylor uh, not too long ago. Um, and I believe that uh, the world needs this. I mean, we are in deep trouble. Um, the materialist model, very self-centered, egocentric, uh, you know, kind of completely out of balance economic and social systems, judicial systems, all of it is a reflection of the false sense of separation that comes out of materialist thought. And so in so many ways, we will do a far better job and truly become homo sapiens. Sapiens means wise. Well, when I look around at a fossil, a fuel addicted world that's with 35,000 species on the verge of extinction, uh, a plastic gyre twice the size of Texas floating in the Eastern Pacific Ocean from all the discarded plastic bags. I don't see a very wise species in charge. And I think that we owe it to this planet, to the blessing of our very existence, to rise to the occasion, to come out of this absolute madness of materialist thought that has led us into such a dark abyss it is time to awaken to the true potential of humanity and truly become homo sapiens for the first time. So I am uh, going to do everything I can to help this world wake up to this far deeper truth and the importance of our responsibility uh, to ourselves, to each other, to future generations. And of course, when you review that reincarnation literature, you can start getting a little bit selfish about that because our own, some aspect of this awareness is going to be living in another body in the future. And we need to do a good job of making sure this planet is not completely wrecked for future generations. You are an incredibly uh, powerful spokesman uh, for this message. And I'm, I'm so with you and i'm so grateful for for the work that you're doing i do pull up a little bit on the last part of what you're saying and i want to just i was going to let you go and then i want to kind of squeeze one more question in there and that's that and you totally get this but like from a spiritual standpoint the doing stuff kind of takes a back seat you know which is essentially the most important part of your message is about love, compassion, being there about 
the light is infinitely more powerful than the dark, you know, and I focus plenty on the dark because I don't want to ignore the dark, but I don't for a minute really concern myself at that level. I'm a, you know, I, I love the quote from uh, Ama the Hugging Saint, you know, she works tirelessly to try and do everything to help the world. And she's in India digging with the, you know, untouchables, digging women, latrines at 18 hours a day. And just how does she have that energy? And then her devotees go, gee, but you said, you know, that we're not about this world. Why you put all your energies into it? And she goes, world, what world? You know, she is in the biblical sense in this world, but not of that world, of this world. And I don't see a conflict at all with what you're saying, but it is a subtle kind of shift. I mean, the compassion that we have to have, and I think you're totally down with this, for everyone, for all the people who are the, not maybe doing the best thing or don't seem to be acting in the interest of the whole, they're not separate either, you know? What, any thoughts on that as we wrap it up? Well, I have a lot of thoughts on that, but I think essentially just to try and uh, boil it down, uh, you know, the deep truth that near-death experiencers come back with, the blessing in their lives, is a rela realization that love binds us all together. It binds uh, all souls to the universe at large. We can trust in a very loving universe at the core of our, of our existence. That's the deep lesson of NDEs. And of course, the important thing that I would stress is it's not so much uh, crucial to, you know, the lessons they give us about what happens when we die. Of course, that's helpful, but far more important is uh, how NDEers would express that their journey showed them how to live this life day to day, every choice, how they view their relationship with themselves, with the universe, with other beings. This is where uh, we can really uh, kind of improve and expand our human experience. Uh, it's, and it's by the work we do here in this world. That's why it's so crucial to realize and, and that's why reincarnation is absolutely essential. If you miss the piece of reincarnation, you're absolutely missing the growth that occurs over time, the, the progress of souls. Uh, and, and reincarnation is a, uh, a story that helps us get to a much deeper truth. But it also uh, points out that the, the true work of soul growth occurs here in these bodies even temporarily dumbed down and believing that this is the only existence there is. Um, you know, our higher soul knows differently from that, but uh, you know, we, we kind of buy into that. And as long as we don't get too sucked into the ego side of it, we can start appreciating this, this benefit of helping others and being there for others. And Alex, I think the biggest uh, uh, shift, uh, uh, certainly a major shift will be how we treat our fellow human beings. But another absolutely essential piece of this is realizing, you know, Homo sapiens doesn't have, uh, you know, a primary claim to spiritual life and the spiritual nature of the universe. The entire animal world, uh, plant kingdom, every bit of it is part of the spiritual universe within consciousness, within this one mind of infinitely bound together through love. And that's why we, we have a tremendous amount of kind of growth and transformation that society needs to go through uh, to fully awaken and assimilate these kind of deep and profound truths. But they're really about how we live in this world. I think that's a fantastic point, particularly in the broader understanding of consciousness. And I want you to go into that in a minute. You know, we know that whales are conscious, dolphins are conscious, conscious. So, you know, you go down the list and that why would we draw some arbitrary line and think it's all, it's all part of this soup. But, but if I can, I, I want to kind of make sure I, I make the point so you can address it. We started with Ram Das and Neem Karoli Baba. And I love this story about Neem Karoli Baba that maybe gets more to my point. And he's talking about, you know, all these Westerners who are coming to see him. This is Ram Dass's guru. That's a kind of an outdated term, but he is the guy who really kind of leads him on this spiritually transformative experience because he's really kind of in the way that we're all messed up. <laughs> he's really kind of has a lot of issues, you know, in his life. And Neem Karoli Baba is transformative, and he's the first one to say that, completely transformative. But 
Neem Kurli Baba says, you Westerners are all about doing, making, doing. He goes, those guys up in the caves, those gurus, those sadhus up in the cave that are sitting there, they're keeping the planet spinning. And I'm sure he's talking about that metaphorically. But the point is, I just pull up short when we start talking about doing and we have to do and we got to reduce that plastic thing in the in the ocean. Of course we do. But we just have to be we have to be with each other. We have to smile at that woman who's wearing a mask driving alone in her car and doesn't understand the science of how that's a, a complete sham. But we can't hate on it. We just have to have love and compassion. And the more that we can face the people that we don't necessarily agree with, with that love and compassion, you know, that's the healing too. So I, I threw a lot out there. What do you think? I would say you're absolutely right on the beam. And, uh, you know, early on in all these discussions after my NDE, as I was trying to come to a deeper understanding of it all, trying to explain to people, trying to come up with a shift in worldview that made sense. I remember Karen pointed out to me very brilliantly that really all we are here to do is to be the love that we are. And when I fully absorbed the depth of what she was telling me, it was not an act of loving or, you know, uh, all of that kind of machination of, well, how do I love myself? How do I love others? But becoming that love, and that, that is something I was very used to from my core experience deep in my NDE in that sanctum sanctorum of the divine, becoming one with that infinitely healing force of love, that God force, is something that is totally indescribable. Uh, and yet it's exactly what, what Karen was uh, uh, urging me to remember about my experience and the importance of unpacking that experience for this world uh, is that we are all uh, are truly bound together through love. And that is what one of the deepest uh, lessons from the tip of the spear of NDEs. They're the tip of the spear in changing this world around consciousness. Uh, but that is the profound lesson that NDEers agree upon is that we are fundamentally uh, essence of pure love. And, and that uh, is something that I think comes out tremendously from the NDE community and also from this uh, larger community of uh, the science of consciousness studies. It's really all about being that love. But uh, in doing so, uh, in becoming that, that's how we can change this world. It, it may come out through all of those things, and let's hope that that does, but it certainly comes out in the work that you're doing, which is just terrific. You know, I mean, I can't stress it enough. I don't know why you were chosen. But thank God you well, were chosen. You were the you were the I, you right know, I, guy I for the you were the that. right guy for the job. Let me tell you. And it's fantastic. Well, you know, I, the thing is, having been where I've been, you know, in this NDE and trying to make sense of it, I realized that, you know, an MD and Harvard and all that stuff doesn't mean squat, doesn't mean a thing. I've met, uh, you know, people from all different walks of life who have had profound NDEs that they shared with me that helped me tremendously in my own understanding. So the, these events are out there, you know, by the millions to help change humanity and help wake us up. I think the only importance of my story in our current cultural kind of uh, paralysis in some sense um, has been that, you know, by being a neuroscientist, uh, even though my brain was so savaged by the infection that when I woke up on day seven of coma in that ICU bed, I did not even recognize my mother, my sisters, my son standing at the bedside. All I knew was where I had just been. My brain was wrecked. But that's the uh, kind of beauty of the message because it then all came back. And, uh, and that's a, kind of an extraordinary uh, story. But what it, what it does is it helps me uh, to understand uh, kind of the depths of, of, uh, of, of my own journey. I mean, if I had been a truck driver and had this experience, my doctors, as my doctors told me, when I woke up not knowing any neuroscience, having none of that knowledge, they said the dying brain plays all kinds of tricks. So you can forget about it. We have no idea how you're coming back to us. Your brain was soaking in pus. Nobody thought you'd even live through it. But 
you can forget about that experience you're trying to tell us about. And so I did. You know, that's where we get back to that story you shared of my son coming home two days after I got out of the hospital. And by then I bought what my doctors told me. The dying brain plays all kinds of tricks. So I told him it was way too real to be real. And that's when he advised me, we'll write it all down before you read anything about somebody else's NDE, because you need a pure version of your story. Best advice I've ever gotten. But uh, that was absolutely uh, critical. But then as my knowledge came back, I realized this is impossible. This cannot happen. And that, of course, is where that case report is so important, because they thought the same thing. This kind of patient did not wake up, and yet I did. Uh, and not only that, I had this profound experience. And of course, that's what they explained scientifically as the explanation for why I had the recovery. And Indeed. I think that's beautiful. It shows <laughs> us that the scientific world is uh, certainly making progress and opening up to truth. I mean, that's what we're all after here. We want to understand the truth. And we should not let our the limitations of our theoretical models, of our inability to assimilate and integrate uh, empirical data, we shouldn't let those weaknesses get in the way of trying to get at the deep truth of all of this. And that involves a very open mind, and it also involves a responsibility to study the data. And I would also say, encourage people, go within. The answers truly lie within us all, meditation, centering prayer, whatever your means of quieting that little voice of the annoying roommate. You know, on a regular basis, I meditate an hour to a day with sacred acoustics and I wouldn't trade it for anything. It's a tremendous gift. Uh, and all of us can come into much greater healing uh, with this kind of, uh, kind of going within. Well, fantastic. And it's been just terrific having you on. Thank you. You're so generous with your time and sharing all this terrific stuff. Thanks for having me on and thank you for what you're doing because I promise you a lot of what I interpret as an improvement in the world's uh, kind of understanding of all this in the last decade, a lot of that is due to your work. So keep it up. Thanks again to Dr. Evan Alexander for joining me today on Skeptico and thanks again for all that he does. It ain't easy doing what he does. So the one question I'd have to tee up from this episode relates back to something we talked about early on in the conversation, and that is Dr. Alexander's near-death experience seems to be tied to his family dynamics in a very powerful way. And I wonder what y'all think about the role of near-death experiences in our personal spiritual journey. I know that's some next level stuff, but I'd really like to go there. I want to go there, so I want you to go there with me and share any thoughts you might have. Track me down on the Skeptical Forum or anywhere else you would like. Until next time, take care and bye for now. <music>